what is very addictive to me is that everything is so vivid in a war zone. You see the worst of humanity, you see the best of humanity. It's all clear. You see, it's clear. <laughs> We'll talk about Clarissa Ward's career, about journalism. She entered the profession, um, I think, 20 years ago this year, after leaving Yale University. First, uh, Clarissa was at um, Fox News at, uh, in New York and Beirut, then based in Moscow for ABC News, then CBS, and since 2015, she has been working out of London, even though I don't think you spent that much time there, um, taking the job in the footsteps of uh, Christiana Amapur as the chief international correspondent for CNN. I can go through all the awards that she won, uh, many Emmy Awards, the Peabody Award, um, but I'll stop there. Uh, Clarissa has been at the front line of many wars, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza, and most recently Ukraine, not just wars, other international crises as well. And um, tonight she's here to talk about journalism, to talk about crisis reporting, to talk about CNN, to talk about Ukraine, and to talk about everything else that comes to mind. There's a Hannah Arendt quote in your book, which yeah. is, I don't, I thought I had it right here, but which is about um, disinformation and mm -hmm. how it basically has... Totalitarianism. Totalitarianism yeah. and how, how it basically has made your job, well, not impossible, but more and more difficult. Yeah. Is it a fight journalists like yourself may lose eventually? I don't think we're going to lose it because we just can't afford to lose it. Right. And so that I, sounds like wishful, wishful thinking more than an actual. I think the real danger that we face right now in our societies is that we're having so much internal divisions about, like, you know, is this a glass or is it, you know, not a glass? Is it a table or is it some, you know, we're, is it water or is it vodka? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> And, um, and, and you need to have, as a society, a sort of a, a set of values or ideals or understanding of history that you kind of agree upon, even if there's a diversity of thought within that that sort of underpins this idea of truth. And when Hannah Arendt talked about misinformation and the danger of it, and when Russians are actively engaging in this, the goal is not to make you believe that Navalny wasn't poisoned, he had a heart attack. The goal is to bombard you with so many different stories about what happened to Navalny that you are completely overwhelmed and at a certain point throw up your hands and say, I guess we'll just never know what happened to Nevada. Flooding, flooding the zone with Flooding shit. the zone yes. with right. crap. Right. And the natural instinct is for everyone to kind of um, like pull away, basically, and, and give up on the idea that truth exists. And when you give up on the idea that truth exists, <clears throat> you're in seriously deep doo-doo as a society. The, the West is following this. Uh, I mean, Western Europe, the US is following this war closely, it seems. And there's a lot of solidarity also mm -hmm. with Ukrainians coming here. You've spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and we'll talk about that later. And I mean, for myself, if I also see how Ukrainian refugees here are being ac accepted, it's great, and I applaud it, but it feels different from the way Syrians or Afghans have been accepted here, and um, I'm sure it's not very different in the UK or, or the US. Yeah, I Is that something you, you, you see the same? I, I mean, on the one hand, I see that like, you know, a million Syrians went into Germany, right, sure. after uh, the horrors that were playing out in that country. And so we but had... there was a lot of fuss about it. There was a lot of fuss about it. And I definitely think it was not the same kind of a welcome, let's say, that we have seen mm -hmm. um, with Ukrainian refugees. I guess the way that I would try to like turn it on its head or focus on it is look how great it's been to have this wonderful reception to people fleeing their homeland in a time of intense strife. And can't we apply that model to refugees coming from all different conflicts? Because at the end of the day, it's really the same idea there. Sure. And, 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 and also like the idea of like, oh, but culturally this, culturally that. I mean, I love Ukraine, but Ukraine is very different culturally from England too. So it's not, it, it, I, I don't really buy into that argument um, necessarily. I think it's about exposure and, and, and having people f more exposed mm. and, and therefore able to feel more comfortable and, f and find more generosity in their hearts. Do you see that solidarity and maybe also the interest of 
the media, which Ukrainians obviously are very afraid of, that especially with the winter starting and mm -hmm. the energy prices being being raised, that the West will get annoyed, lose interest. CNN is sending you back to Ukraine. That's good. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we're we're living in a world where we're having a conversation about the specter of nuclear war, which is not something that has been fathomable in my lifetime. So obviously, this is a hugely pressing and important conflict that we all need to be paying attention to. At the same time, you're right, and I know this from every conflict I've ever covered, it is challenging to maintain people's interests, to keep people engaged, particularly if a story starts to feel like it's sort of day in, day out, looks very much the same, sounds very much the same. Now, unfortunately, in some ways, and fortunately in others, the situation in Ukraine is changing very quickly on the ground now, with Ukrainians having huge success uh, with some of these counteroffensives, <clears throat> with the blowing up of the Kerch Strait Bridge, the retaliation for that we saw on Monday, the mobilization in Russia. I mean, things are happening really fast, which I think when that, when that occurs, there's a natural tendency. It's on the front pages again. People are engaged again. But there will come a moment, mm. undoubtedly, in a couple months' time, potentially, where it sort of slows and where, yes, it becomes more of a challenge again mm. to try to keep people focused. Covering Ukraine also means not covering other crises, yeah. other wars, not going to Eritrea or going mm -hmm. to other places in Africa or going to, to Syria. Is that, um, that, that is sometimes a difficult decision, I suppose? I mean, I'm pretty, I'm very lucky with my position at CNN because, of course, I spent 12 years in Ukraine this year and I'm about to go back for another few. 12 weeks? 12 weeks. Right. Did I just say 12 years? It, it may have felt like 12 wow. years. Wow. Maybe I should have had that vodka. <laughs> um, yeah. So I spent 12 well, we'll, weeks we'll get you in vodka. Ukraine this year and I'm going back for another few weeks now. Um, but I also, you know, our team made a point of going to Somalia over the summer um, because there is almost certainly going to be a famine and the effects of the energy crisis, the food crisis, <coughs> inflation, all of that is having a compounded effect on other countries around sure. the world. We went to Pakistan to cover the floods. So I feel in my role at CNN that like part of that responsibility is like, Yes, we get that Ukraine is like the most pressing issue right now that the, you know, the Western world at least is dealing with. But there are a lot of other really important issues going on as well. We need to keep covering them too. Mm -hmm. how, how do you make your, or I guess who makes your travel plans? It, do you decide? Does the bureau decide? Is it a combination It's of a both? combination. It's a combination. So uh, we will pitch a lot. Sure. Um, these are stories we want to do. Can you give us lots of money? Um, <laughs> lots of money. Lots of money to sometimes wait for months and it doesn't work out, but hey, we tried. Um, and then there's a, for them, you know, okay, I think you're in, I was in Pakistan when the queen died. Okay, you need to come back to London and cover the funeral. Um, Why, by the way? Why would you, I mean, as a, with so much shit going on, why would you cover the royal funeral? Because... <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> um, I understand that it needs to be covered. I just feel a little sorry for you that you had to do it. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> I, uh, well, I did, they did let me say like two days. So I got, I got a couple of pieces on um, from Pakistan. But listen, the queen dying, I think it's, it's hard to sort of overstate the kind of impact that it did have. I think in a way that people didn't really necessarily even anticipate, but she was sort of part of the furniture, right? Like everybody grew up with her. She was part of everyone's lives for as long as anyone knew. And so in this kind of moment of... I think pretty profound anxiety about like where the world's going and the rise of autocracies and sure. the queen dying. I I did feel like it kind of knocked everyone off balance a little bit. Um, no, I understand, and it's and also your I forgot to mention your half British, so I think I just said yeah, something bad. Yeah, my granny's voice was in my yeah. I know. I, get back. I apologize. <laughs> um, but but and, and and obviously it's it's a big story for the UK. But but and I understand that it's being covered. Uh, but obviously your talents could be used elsewhere. Oh, and let's be clear, a third CNN of Pakistan your face on was the underwater. A right. third of Pakistan was underwater. So like, this is a huge story. It's a really important story. And these are difficult decisions to make. Mm. When you're the chief international correspondent 
part of that role is whatever the biggest story is. You're there. You're there, and you're and 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 you're representing. So you don't argue. Not just me. It's a you know. Sure. It's very much an orchestra. Right. But yeah. You say in the book after another bomb blast. Wow. That, I mean, it was bad. But I'm addicted. Yeah. Uh, how does that work? I mean, many crisis correspondents say that. Yeah. What are you addicted to? I think it, when you start out at a very young age, you're addicted to like the excitement and the adventure, and you feel like you're in a movie because you've never been in a war zone. So right. the only thing you know about war comes from movies and literature, and so it feels sort of glamorous and exciting. And then you, you know, usually at some point have a very sobering and serious um, close encounter with death, and that shifts your frame of focus a little bit and makes you realize that it, it actually isn't glamorous and mm. it's not exciting, it's horrifying and it's, um, and it's very, very frightening. But you're still addicted. But you but then become addicted, well, but, oh, but I survived and I'm here to tell the story and, and what happens when you survive is that you can't really connect to that feeling of fear in that same visceral way you experience. It's like there's a veil between your experience and living it and then the retelling of it. Mm -hmm. But then I sort of got past that too, because I was like, no, I just really don't like being in situations where I feel like my life is genuinely at risk. And then I think now what is very addictive to me is that everything is so vivid in a war zone. You see the worst of humanity, you see the best of humanity. It's all clear. You see, it's clear. All this rubbish that fills our lives, you know, and, and there's a great scene in this movie, The Hurt Locker, it's about a mm. soldier who has PTSD and he goes back from Iraq and he, his wife sends him out to buy toothpaste and he's in one of these giant American supermarkets and he's looking at like 70 kinds of toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, what? The hell? But you're in that supermarket too in uh, and, and last I, week. Yeah, no, and I, and I know that feeling of like, you come back and you're like, wow, we have like just filled our lives with so much stuff that means nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice. There is a clarity that comes with war, you know, and, uh, and a sort of vividness and that contrast, and, and yes, the darkness, but also the things that, those, those pearls that shine in the rubble, like they really shine. Is there such a thing as a, as a just war? I think there is such a thing as a just war, but just because a war is just, it doesn't make it any less tragic. What war was just? It doesn't, well, I think a lot of wars start out as uh, just. I mean, if you look at the beginning of the Syrian uprising, I mean, and what started it, the boys in Dara, who just said, you know, we want freedom, or Ashab Yurid, Yuskot al Nizam, like the people want the overthrowing of the regime. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can understand how people felt that that was uh, the beginnings of a, of a powerful and just uprising. But what happens almost invariably along the way is that there's so much bloodshed and so much horror and so much grief and anger that everybody starts to lose their humanity a little bit. And things become muddied and murky and it's, uh, it's no longer easy to look at things in black and white terms. Um, and I think we definitely saw that in Syria, like the, the nature of the of the Taura, the uprising, like it changed a lot over the years. People were beaten down and broken and and bloodied and desperate and um, and there were other actors who were willing to exploit that, whether it was Nusra or Daesh or whoever. And um, so even though a war can be just, I mean, I think if you ask Ukrainians right now, are they fighting a just war defending their homeland? Like, I think you would be hard pressed to find a, a better definition of a, of a just war in terms of being illegally invaded by an outside country. I guess it's often when, when other countries invade, whether it's Iraq or, or Russia, then people start saying this is an unjust war. Maybe Bosnia was a you could argue was a just war. Mm. When nothing happened in Rwanda, that could have been a just war. Mm. But mm. usually the international, you know, when, when the US interferes, it usually 
and it's even worse, right? It just it's very rarely as clear as we want it to be. We have a fundamental desire as human beings for such a clarity and for black and white and yes and no and good and bad and and a man it would make life a lot easier but part of doing this job is that like you live in the gray a little bit and and that is the nature of war and you see horrors carried out by people you would never have expected that from and you see moments of heroism from people who are monsters is ukraine a, a gray war um I think that Ukraine, because it was like, you know, an illegal invasion of a country by a far greater outside superpower. Um, I, I mean, obviously the invasion was unjust, but the the Ukrainian response to it and the fight back, I think, yeah, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to yeah. find a better definition of a just war. You're right. Why, of all places, did, does Syria seem to touch you the most, without disregarding the other places? But well, I mean, you heard Ismail sing, and 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 like the poetry and the sensitivity of the Syrian soul. I mean, I don't want to like generalize an entire people, but Syria is an extraordinary place. I hope that some of you had the opportunity to visit it um, before the war. It's incredibly beautiful, rich in history and culture and vibrant and diverse. And I just felt like it was one of the most intoxicating, fascinating places I had ever been. And I had also never experienced hospitality like that in my life. Certainly in the West, I think we have a very different idea about hospitality. In my family, we used to joke that guests were like fish you know they go bad after a few days <laughs> in syria like you go to someone's house and like you know the brother just died and it's like you'll take this room and you'll be my guest for as long as you want to be and i'm going to bring you breakfast and every meal and you know mm. cater to your every women need even though i'm at like the lowest point in my entire life wow that's hospitality <laughs> um and i found that profoundly humbling and moving um Was there a sense of guilt um, and, and did being American make your job in Iraq, but maybe in other places too, more, more difficult, actually doing the job with people realizing you were American or yeah. did you use your British accent? No, I mean, I use my British passport a lot because, uh, you know, it's marginally less hated. Uh, well, but the emphasis really on marginally. The past years, well. Um, <laughs> I think it was a really difficult time to be an American um, and to, there's a big difference, you know, when you live in the US and you read about foreign policy and you watch it on the news, that's one thing. And then it's another thing to like actually go and live in people's countries and understand that there's a giant chasm often between the way America sees its role in the world and the way the rest of the world sees its Uh, presence in their various countries. Mm. And so that is, for any young American, I think a really humbling thing to experience up close. And uh, it can be really painful as well, because you're also spending time with the US military, for example, in Iraq, and seeing that, you know, there are a lot of really fine young American men with really good intentions who have been sort of corralled into this, uh, ultimately what I felt was, you know, a, a really misguided um, mission from the get-go. And, uh, and, and so many people died as a result. And ultimately, I think we feel the sort of, the ripple effects of, of how the entire region was destabilized and, and, and the sort of fundamental makeup of the region was recalibrated in a way that we're still feeling the sort of aftershocks of that today. 9-11 obviously was a big event nevertheless, but in your life as well, because as I said in the introduction, that's that when you decided you wanted to be a journalist, also because as you write in the book, you wanted, you wanted to understand where the rage Uh, came from. Mm. Um, uh, so have you gotten to learn to understand more of that? No, 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 I do understand that. I mean, look, I was in Afghanistan one, one year and two months ago at the end of a 20-year occupation and people are coming up to me and 
begging for help to get out of the country and sobbing because their daughters won't be able to go to school or have the kinds of jobs that they had dreamed of for them and feeling like they were sold a dream that they're no longer allowed to have and um, feeling anger and, you know, and again, it's like you have to open your eyes to things that are painful and uncomfortable and challenge the way you view yourself and the way you view where you come from. And that is, that's, that is part of being a good journalist. And it's not even necessarily about being American or not. It's about being willing to like put your ego and your preconceptions away at the door and sit and really listen to people and understand that their experience of the world, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, is very different than yours. Mm -hmm. And that's the fundamental job, right? Is trying to explain to you why the view there is so different and allowing you to connect with that reality in a way that makes it more accessible and that hopefully in an ideal world allows people to kind of talk and experience each other's versions of reality more and, and, and make less harsh judgments about them. You write about the disappointment many of these men must have felt looking at the war in Syria. But have you gotten to understand uh, better that they joined, you know, yeah. right from London where you live, that mm -hmm. they joined these um, radical groups? Yes, I do. You know, Hannah Arendt talked about like the banality of evil. Um, and I think the sort of ISIS phenomenon is a really good illustration of that because you expect there to be, you know, this kind of extraordinary quality to evil. And actually what you see more often than not is that it's, it's quite mundane. And I think with a lot of these young guys, I mean, Yilmaz is just one example, um, it's not dissimilar from joining a gang, right? Um, it's about feeling a sense of belonging, about having value, about connection, dignity, um, so many complicated factors, and there isn't like a one size fits all. But what you do realize is that once you kind of immerse yourself in that world a little bit more, you can quite easily see how at that moment in time, with Syria raging, with the horrors on all of our screens, it was like a perfect storm. Um, and you were going to have a lot of young guys who were probably initially attracted to the just war component and wanting to defend people who were being slaughtered, but then very quickly got suckered into something, you know, dark beyond belief. And the problem with war is that if you haven't experienced it before, you have no idea what you're getting into. And once you do experience it, you become desensitized to it. And so the longer... There's hardly a way out. And, and, and so you, the longer you are there, the darker your soul is getting. No matter how good a person you think you are. It's just the reality. What they believed they saw was obviously what's been called parachute journalism. Yeah. Big international I, stars being flown in into yeah. the country for a week or less. Yeah. Doing their thing yeah. without, and you know, instead of maybe letting local journalists yeah. do the job in front of the camera. What is your response? My response is that, first of all, like we rely 100% on the reporting of local journalists. Like right. We can't do anything without them. They are the bravest, they are the boldest, <clears throat> they are in the trenches day in, day out, and they are the backbone. Um, and so I have nothing but tremendous respect for them. The reality is, though, that if I am trying to tell a story to an international audience or to an American audience in particular, with CNN being you know, a US network, um, it is going to be easier for me as an American to get that attention focused on Myanmar if I am there than it is if that journalist sure. is on the ground. Now, and also, to be honest, because of security considerations, like you couldn't put Myanmar journalists mm. on television from Myanmar. For, I had a measure of protection mm -hmm. be, precisely because I am a white Western journalist who was coming in just for one week. I had a measure of protection. Mm -hmm. So I could ask harder questions. I could be ruthlessly critical in a way that honestly would probably cost a local journalist potentially their life or certainly would result in them being imprisoned. Mm -hmm. So I view that as being a position of great privilege. Sure to be able to like put a lot of attention and a spotlight 
on Myanmar for that time that I'm there and to have that, that modicum of protection afforded to me because I work for CNN. Um, and so of, I view sorry. it as a real responsibility, right. yeah. A couple of the citizens you spoke to were arrested. Yeah. Most of them were re later released, but I, yeah. I don't think all. Um, they, were, they were all released. They were all released. Yeah. The but, ones but, who we talked to were right, released. Right, right. Yeah. But it's still, is, is that a dilemma? Because you know that that could happen? So, I mean, <laughs> first of all, I would say I never expected people just to start coming up to us no. and, you know, doing the, the, the sign of the... Uh, of the revolution. I mean, that just never, I, I never, I've never seen bravery like that. Because that occurred when, I'm surrounded you, by um, the military and by right. the police. So it never occurred That's to what me. happens. They would yeah. come up to you and... I mean, because in the beginning, they wouldn't really let us go around. And then I was like, can we just see a market? I just would like to get some video of like life. There's no, we, we hadn't really been allowed into Yangon. So they were like, fine, we'll take you to a market. We go to a market, we turn on our camera and within two minutes, people just start coming up. And then they all start banging their pots and pans like crazy. The whole market and people just start running in. And of course, we all looked at each other and we're like, okay, this is an intense situation because, we, you know, this could be dangerous for these people, obviously. And we were saying to them very clearly, look, we, we're surrounded by security services. We are here. Get out of here. At the, but they had a message that they wanted to deliver and that they wanted the world to hear. And is it my job as a journalist to be like, no, no, I know better than you do what's good for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to censor you and not deliver your message. And by the way, you're still going to jail because the guy was there and saw you anyway. So no, what we did, we let them have their say. We told them to calm, you know, there was a sense at one stage that it could turn into like a protest almost. And it was like, do not do that. We left after a few minutes. And then we boycotted every event that the junta tried to get us to go to until they were all released. Right. So which they were eventually. Which they were. Yeah. It's not an ideal situation, obviously, as a journalist. You're at the center of the story, and people are putting themselves in 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 you know positions of real vulnerability because you're there. And so that's always uncomfortable as a journalist. But ultimately, I still think there was like a hugely powerful report. Um, and I'm really glad that we did it because I feel like the people of Myanmar deserve to have their story told and have their voices heard. The only way to, to get in was obviously with the permission of the Myanmar, of the, yeah. of the junta. Yeah. Uh, and it has been written, but I don't know if this is true, but you, you may know that it had been arranged by, um, uh, uh, I think a businessman who mm -hmm. was a lobbyist for the junta and was yeah. being paid by the junta as well. Yeah, I don't think he ever got paid. Okay, but did it feel like you were being part of a PR campaign, which is something different than th the result may have been not PR, but was the intention of the junta to let you in? I think they that... They wanted a good story. Out. I, I don't know what the junta thought the result was going to be of letting us in, because to be <clears throat> honest, I think it was pretty clear that they were not going to get a good news story <laughs> um, out of this. So it's hard for me to know what went on behind closed doors in terms of how they were persuaded to do it. Um, but I will say again, this is a, as a journalist, like we're constantly like, well, do we get Iran visas? And we have minders all the time. When we get visas, I mean, not me, but my colleagues who go to Syria, uh, you know, with the Assad regime, like we're constantly getting visas from either corrupt, authoritarian, dictatorships, you know, tyrants, who will try to curtail your movements, tell you what you can do and what you can't do, what you sh can show and you can't show. And ultimately, I think the vast majority of journalistic outlets come out on the side of like, it's still better to go. To be there. To be there, be on the ground, see it, understand that you are not seeing a full picture, but at least you can sit down and ask some of these people to give an accounting for their actions. And during the live shot, you can obviously say what you want. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was awkward. They were all standing right there like, uh, right. I can't believe she's really saying this, but you know, it she was- She said it. Yeah. But, yeah. Just, just one more thing on, on parachute journalism, yeah. because you're aware of the discussion. And this is a quote from Dina Abu Ghazala. She works for Al Jazeera in Egypt. 
And she writes, this was I think last year, the prevalent model in international media's coverage of the global south is that local journalist role is largely limited to fixers. We spoke about that. We never seem to question why Western media outlets choose to send their own reporters and employ so-called fixers in the global south to provide translation, setting up interviews, and quite often provide crucial local insights and access to characters without whom the story wouldn't work. Why is it okay for international media outlets to use the expertise of locals to publish or broadcast a report under a Western correspondent's name instead of investing in locals to tell their own story? Mm. I think you gave part of the answer. Yeah. But it's still a valid point in a sense. It, it is. You're basically saying I'm the megaphone, CNN is the megaphone, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You have a stage that they don't, but it's still... It's not just that you have a stage, it's that you know how to tell a story to your audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to pretend that I know how to tell a story to the audience of South Sudan, right? And that I'll know the most compelling language and comparisons and, and way to present that story. Right. But I, I have a pretty good sense of how to tell a story to Americans, mm -hmm. to make them care, to make them pay attention, to make them be engaged. I also think there is a really important point underlying this, which is, first of all, those local journalists should always get a byline. Right. Right? They which should they do always, at CNN. Yeah. Unless it brings them in danger. I Unless guess. it brings them in danger, they always would. And by the way, there are many situations, <clears throat> you know, that we have at CNN bureaus where, where there are local journalists who are the correspondents covering uh, various countries around the world. So there needs to be, obviously, um, more diversity and a more vibrant ecosystem with more voices, and particularly the voices of people on the ground um, being amplified. But to me, it's not so much that like one needs to be at the expense of the other. Like You're working together and acting in concert to try to tell a fuller and broader story to a wider audience, ideally. And apart from the ethics of it, or whatever you want to call it, and your point is very clear, but you used to live in Moscow for a while and in uh, Beijing, mm. where you were a stand-in for Uma Thurman at the Kill Bill film, but we spoke about that. Um, so you lived there for a couple of years and you really get to know a place. Mm. Um, now you're, you're, it's still, whether you call it parachuting or somebody, something else, you're there for a week, or mm -hmm. in this case Ukraine, you were there for 12 weeks. Um, but do you always have a sense that you have a real good grip on the story? Because if they fly me into Pakistan right now, no matter how many good local journalists I work with, I still would have a sense that I don't really yeah. feel the, know the story. I, mean, I would be afraid to make mistakes. I know what you mean, and, and I would just say that, like, after doing this for 20 years now, I mean, I, there are many stories that I feel relatively experienced with, whether it's Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine, um, China, although like it's been a long time since I've been able to go back to China. So um, you feel that what you have are like the, the, the basic sort of foundations of understanding the story. And then yes, there is an element when uh, there's a big news story that happens of like having to read in and read up and, and make sure that you're on top of your game. But there will also be things that will happen where I will say, I'm not an expert on that. And so I'm not going to go and pretend that I'm an expert on, you know, the troubles in Northern Ireland, right? I I'm not. Um, but if, if new troubles occur in Northern Ireland, you, CNN will send you there. I, you I would think have to pretend probably, that you are an expert. They would probably send Nick Robertson first, who's covered that story. Well, Nick, uh, let's assume Nick has COVID. You don't know Nick. Nick would still go, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> now you're forcing me to say, what if Nick is not run. around anymore? <laughs> Um, Poor Nick. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, listen, I do take your point, um, and it is... It's, I mean, I'm a it's, TV... I, I, it's one I, of the I stresses of the job, of course. Sure. It's a lot of responsibility. Do you sometimes feel unsure about whether what you're saying is true? Or is it, I'm sure it's true, but it's, it's backed up enough by... See, I think I am smart enough to be humble about what I don't know. And I'm not going to try to pretend to anyone when I'm on television that I'm an expert on everything in the world. I'm not. And so there will be plenty of times covering the Queen's funeral. 
I don't normally cover the Royals. Okay, this is a very different sort of thing to what you're talking about, but like, I'm not an expert on the Royals. So I was happy to sit there during these panels and be quiet a lot and, and to chime in when I felt like there was a moment where there was something to say or contribute. I don't need to dominate just because my role says I'm chief international correspondent. Right. You know, if I can enhance the coverage in some way, that's great, mm -hmm. but I am not the sort of authority on every topic, not by any stretch of the imagination. I really enjoyed our conversation. Good luck in Ukraine. Thank you, Clarissa Ward. Oh, thank you.